So, okay, today uh, let's look at the katana. Katana. Uh, it's a Japanese sword. Uh, it's been made for hundreds and hundreds of years, usually along the same lines in terms of metallurgy uh, and tempering and traditional ways of wrapping. When you look at the katana, you see a number of different parts. The first part, the handle, called the suka. The suka is made up of several parts. First is a layer of wood, which is hollowed out and brought back together, slid over the tang of the sword. In the very front, you'll have what's called the, kash the fuchin kashira. The fuchin kashira are the end pieces of the handle here and here. When that is put on, then you wrap the handle with uncured, untanned ray skin. It's very, very stiff, extremely strong, and very hard to cut without ruining your knife edge, which it will do in an instant. You soak the ray skin in water until it's very soft. Then you wrap it, bind it, wait for it to uh, harden around the handle itself so it's nice and firm. Once that's done, then you take a cord. In this case, I, uh, I wrap this myself. I use a traditional silk cord, and I wrap it using a double turn, not a twist. A double twist leaves raised edges. A double fold or turn leaves flat edges, making the handle much more comfortable to use. Now, depending on the period, most periods used the manuki, the ornaments, as palm swells. During the Edo period, they were used as finger swells. They were reversed, but they're used to help position the hand and give a little bit of feeling of secure comfort. You start here at the very base. You wrap and wrap and wrap, making these perfect little diamonds, hopefully, if you do it right. And if you don't do it right, you'll notice because it'll look uneven and loose. We want this as tight as possible. I use a vise and several clamps to keep these wrapped as I work my way up the handle. At the end of this, you have the end knot, which is an art in itself. As a matter of fact, this whole thing takes quite a bit of artwork and practice to get it done right. If you don't do it right, it falls apart or it looks really bad. This is a rather short handle. I have one that's very short, one that's about this much longer, used for uh, very heavy cutting. This is called the suba, the guard. In, on each side of the suba, there are little brass flat plates here and here. Use as spacers. These spacers help hold this in place nice and tight. Then you have this collar here, the habaki. And then as you take the sword out, you'll see that it has or doesn't have either a full line blood groove called a bohi or a temper line along the edge of the blade. The way you can tell a temper line that's fake from one that's real is that the temper line on a real sword is very uneven. It's not as regular as clockwork. It varies all the way up the blade. This is made with a clay process of pounding and pulverizing rice, uh, charcoal rice, until it becomes a very fine, fine, fine gray ash. At that point, it's layered along the blade in a particular pattern. What that does when this is plunged back into the heat again is it helps to even the temperature along the edge of the blade so that the edge is actually harder than the rest of the blade. That line that's made, that wavy line, is called a hammond. And if it's very regular and looks like it's made by a machine, then it was, and it's fake. If it's very uneven, and looks almost random, you can be assured that it's the real thing. And I might be able to get a close-up of this here. So as we look closely, we might just be able to see the Hammond on the blade. This isn't the best lighting in the world, but as you see, as I pull this blade along, you'll see that line. Another thing about this sword is its curve. Its curve is usually brought about by the tempering process. It's not on purpose. It's a, it's a function or 
uh, a result of tempering. The Ninja To, which is a very straight sword, almost identical in size and shape, except that it's very straight, they get rid of that by bending it back into place constantly, over and over again as they temper. In this case, the curve of the sword adds in cutting. Discovery Channel did a documentary on the different cutting abilities of swords. The last test was a, t a contest between a, uh, an, a European broadsword, which was very, very heavy, some seven or eight pounds, and the Japanese katana. In cutting, the katana far outdid the Japanese broadsword in both penetration and slicing, even though it was half the weight. The reason was because of the blade geometry itself, the way the sword is made, the way it's tempered, and its metallurgy, which was far beyond anything Europe had to offer at the time. This particular sword is not an authentic Japanese katana. That would cost me more money than probably my house. <laughs> In this case, this is as close a reproduction as you can get made by uh, someone who is very, very good at it and has done it in Japan for many years, many decades. So it's built very traditionally. What holds the handle on is the makugi, or the pins that go through the handle and into the tang. And on this particular sword, there are two of them, one here and one here. So, that's the basic look of the sword and the way it's made. In drawing and sheathing, we have a whole different way of dealing with it. In order to sheath the sword properly, and you want to do this in a manner of the samurai, never, ever look at the blade or the sheath. There's a reason for that. If you have to take your eyes off your enemy to sheath your sword, well, your attention is not where it should be. It should be on your surroundings, not on sheathing. So let's take a look at the traditional Iaido draw and sheath. I'll step back here. In wearing the sword, we want this part, the very end of the suka, to be directly in center line with your xiphoid process. That's where it's going to hang. You want a slight tilt, just like this. In drawing, we lay our hand here. We're going to grab very loosely here. We won't put our thumb on the top. It's not going to happen. It's a bad way to draw. We're going to put it off to the side. And as we step back, we're going to loosen it just a little. At this time, we're not turning the saya or the scabbard at all. So we step back. The hand rests here. These knuckles rest along the spine of the blade. When we draw, if we keep the saya completely vertical as it is, edge up, we draw straight up by pushing the sheath, drawing, and then pulling the sheath back to release the sword. From here, we step up either into this position here, this position, or this position. They all have their advantages. This is a very traditional attack position. This is a very traditional guard position. This is what's called a defensive position. The hands are held in a very specific way. The little finger wraps around the butt here. This hand is pushed up tight, but the index fingers on both hands are very, very relaxed. They are not tightened up. The sword is controlled not by the index fingers, but by the bulk of the thumb pad and the little finger. That is what controls your cut. In cutting, the elbows come out, the hands open up. In the downward stroke, the hands will twist together like you're wringing a wash rag. We wring it. At the same time, we're pulling. This is not a hack job. This is not a hatchet. This is a sword. It's meant to slice. So when we bring in the cut, we come in and you notice the slicing action. The same goes true with the side cut. If we're cutting to the side, we may start here and bring the sword all the way across and slice here, pulling as we go. Same with the upward strike. We strike up, come in, and slice. 
So when you make these moves, down, across, up, and back, we look at how the body works. The body moves in complete concert with the sword. Everything the sword does, our entire body's behind. So when we make that downward strike from here, we come in <coughs> straight down. If we're making our side cut, we may start here and come across <coughs> here. Notice the turn of the body, the position of the legs. And the upward cut, we start here dropping the body and bringing the sword up. Another side strike here, completely to the side. And after our cutting is done, we bring the sword up. We're going to shake the blood out. We don't want to leave too much blood on it. Or we can draw it across the sleeve, but again, never touch the blade. Draw the blood. Without looking, grab your sheath. Use your hand to keep the blade from dragging across the side. And if your angles are proper, you won't be driving straight across the same angle as the side. You'll be doing this at about an angle like this. And what you're going to do is you're going to bring it until you hear the click. Click. Bring it forward. Bring the saya to the sword. Bring the whole thing back. And secure it. The saya is a place of peace. Once it's drawn in tradition, it's supposed to draw blood. In this case, I really don't have enough to spare, so I'm going to omit the blood drawing. But this is a very, very sharp sword. It's used specifically to cut. It's a combat sword. That's how it was built. It's a combination of sw uh, powdered Swedish spring steel and 1095 high carbon steel. It'll rust. That's why you don't want to touch it. After every use, wipe it down, powder it, re-oil it again before you put it back in the sheath. So, this is a little breakdown on what the katana really is, how it's used, and how it works. Thank you.